If Christ is king, how should the Christian consider the kingdoms of this world? What does the Bible teach us about human authority and what it means to love our neighbors and our enemies? Before we render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, let's know what it means to render unto God what is God's. This is the Biblical Anarchy Podcast, the modern prophetic voice against war and empire. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Biblical Anarchy Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. This week and every week on Biblical Anarchy, we seek to live counterculture to the empire of man and to instead seek the kingdom of God by unpacking what the Bible teaches about government, authority, and human relationships. I am your host, Jacob Daniel. I am glad to be back after a week of crazy sickness. First, I lost my voice to a cold, and then I went down with a stomach bug that ensnared my entire family. I'm thankful for Carrie Baldwin for helping me out with the production of the last episode, which I hope you enjoyed and you should check out if you haven't yet. For today's episode, I thought I'd follow up last week's not at all controversial topic with another easy slam dunk topic, gay marriage. Now, this topic needs broken down into multiple components. First of all, We need to define what the Bible defines marriage as and what its purpose is. Secondly, we need to answer what the Bible says about homosexuality in general and homosexual relationships. Third, we need to then answer what the response to the concept of gay marriage should be for a Christian following biblical principles. Also, it's worth stating here at the outset, which I've talked about before, But on this podcast, we believe in the divine inspiration and inerrancy of the scriptures. Jesus himself said in John 10 that the scriptures cannot be broken. And that means we have to take all of scriptures and work to reconcile them with themselves. We cannot hide away from the parts that we don't like. Now, that said, proper exegesis does mean distinguishing passages that are poetic from passages that are literal. And while God's revealed word doesn't contain errors in that which it teaches, our errant and limited minds will sometimes struggle to grasp the truth and meaning of what is in the Bible. We will be diving into some texts in Genesis that Christians of good faith will have some disagreements over whether these stories are literal depictions of events or rather allegories of a sort. I believe either view can be used, though, and it is not my goal in this episode to make a case for either position. Now, with that out of the way, to start out, what does the Bible define marriage as? Well, in the very beginning, God formed the first man, Adam, out of the dust. But soon later, God declared that it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. This is Genesis 2.18. Adam needed Eve, and the nature of humanity required women. Now, God doesn't just make woman out of thin air. Rather, he forms Eve out of the rib of Adam. And this is interesting and relevant on multiple levels, not only because woman is made from man, but it's made from the rib, which signifies not being above or below man, but rather being conjoined with him side by side. Furthermore, before the fall had even happened, God states, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So we get a pretty clear picture here in the beginning of Genesis, even before the fall, that man and woman were made for each other, and that there was something in the creation of man alone that wasn't enough. And even before the fall, I think it's extremely significant to, again, point out that God is already saying that man, that the natural order is that man shall leave his father and his mother and then hold fast to his wife, and then they shall become one flesh. And this is significant on multiple levels. I mean, it's sort of like becoming one flesh because that is from which they came. We also know that marriage is a sort of reflection or metaphor for our relationship to Christ and his church, and that we are the bride of Christ, so to speak. So there's a lot in marriage and in sex between man and a woman that is created by God and that God declares as good, and that this fits within the natural order. Since sin is a rebellion against God and God's decrees, including God's natural order, 
and that which he has declared good. Heterosexual marriage, then, is what God declares as functionally and morally normative. And this really sets the stage for the rest of the Bible. And although we could go into the different passages that specifically mention homosexuality themselves, it's not really necessary. From the get-go, from the very beginning, God declares that we are to be men and women, and we are to be joining together as one flesh, and we are then told later to go forth and to be fruitful and to multiply. And that's never rescinded, and there's never any exception made to the institution of marriage or to sex that there is actually some sort of allowance or similar reflection in God's order for the pairing of two men or two women. It's just not biblical at all. Now, this isn't to say that people who are either have a struggle with being attracted to someone of the same sex, or even if we could posit that it's even possible in a fallen creation, that there are going to be people who are born who only ever experience same-sex attraction, and we could say that their sexuality has been altered by sin, by the fall, and therefore they don't have a normal attraction to the opposite sex. This in and of itself, although it's a result of sin, is not rebellion against God, any more so than anyone who has any desire that is contrary to what God wants for them is necessarily sinning. Rather, it's what we do with those desires and where we put those desires before God that determines if something is a sin or not. This gets to the heart of the issue, I think, with why gay marriage is a sin and why really any participation in homosexual relationships is a sin. Because ultimately, the justifications that you hear from homosexuals who are trying to justify their relationships with others of the same sex and be able to claim that that is not in conflict with what God wants or what the Bible teaches is that they don't ultimately appeal to what Scripture says. They try to find ways to work around what Scripture says, and it becomes an argument from empathy and an argument from, this is just so hard, how could God ask us to do this? But what you don't often hear in the justification for why homosexual relationships would not be sinful is that, well, this is part of God's design and this is what God wants. Rather, it's sort of flipped upside down from what a actual examination of what we are told living for God and living for Christ requires us to do. It requires us to die to ourselves and to die to our flesh and to tell ourselves no and to put God and what he commands first above our own desires. This is what is at the heart of the gospel and of the entirety of scripture. But then suddenly when it comes to a topic like homosexuality, would there be an exception to this? I don't think that that is consistent. I don't think that there's any basis for it. And I've done my best to approach this subject and not just appeal to tradition, because tradition can be wrong, just because the church has, for most of its history, and we can go back even say before the church when the followers of God were followers of Judaism. So we can go back over a long history and say that the traditional view seems to be against homosexuality. That's not a justification in and of itself, though, to say that homosexuality is sinful. We have to look to the text, and we have to look to what it seems to pretty clearly state, which is that at the beginning we were designed male and female, and that marriage and sex were meant to be observed by a man and a woman together, and anything outside of that is outside of God's natural order. And although there are other things in the equation, such as ceremonial law and a desire to keep the Jews pure and separate from surrounding pagan cultures, one can't deny that a lot of the homosexuality that was practiced in the days of 
the Bible and ancient Israel or even in Jesus' time was different than the homosexuality of today. And that's often an argument you hear in support of why homosexuality is not forbade by the scriptures is because, well, the homosexuality of the Bible, it was all ceremonial, it was ecclesiastical, and and the surrounding cultures used homosexuality in ways that were often unconsensual and that were about lust and abuse and dominance, and not just two men or two women loving each other and trying to love each other and have a relationship together consensually, monogamously, and to follow God in that relationship. And then certain passages that perhaps have been changed from their original language where it just talks about sexual immorality, and then in certain translations it'll say homosexuality. There is some merit to those arguments in terms of just the small minutia of what those scriptures actually say and some context into all of these specific reasons that homosexuality was banned or talked negatively about in those certain contexts. And I don't want to diminish from that or act as if those aren't true facts. But when we are going to establish what is biblically normative and what we are going to establish as part of God's order comes into question, there's nothing in the Bible that would come to the support of homosexuality. And rather, we see a strong support and emphasis on the sanctity and the divine plan and creation of humanity as man and woman, and that they were made for each other, and that this reflects and glorifies God. The issue comes down to, is sin merely doing things that are not consensual, and anything that is consensual and that makes you feel good is therefore normal or in concordance with what God has decreed as his order and as right and wrong? Or does sin go beyond mere consent? Now, to libertarians and to anarchists, consent is sort of the name of the game. But that is because libertarians and anarchists are not trying to establish a complete, holistic, moral philosophy about that or that would touch every area of life and inform people as to the right way to live in every area of their life. Rather, it speaks to the question of when violence is justified and the proper role and function of civil governance. Therefore, we cannot conflate libertarian ethics, so to speak, with biblical morality and what God says is sin or not sin. And sin goes beyond consent. Now, clearly, if something isn't consensual between two human beings, it's going to be sinful. So there is overlap. Everything that is not consensual between two or more adults is going to be sinful, but not everything that is consensual is therefore not sinful. Instead, we have to define sin according to what the Bible says. And again, sin is anything that we put before God. And I would state that there are many people who put their sexual preferences and desires before God. And that doesn't matter if your sexual preference is to have adultery or to have sex with multiple partners, even if they are partners of the opposite sex, and to do so out of the context of marriage, or to have sex with the with a person of the same sex, and to do so outside of the context of biblically defined marriage and the proper relationships by which to engage in sexual activity, that does not matter. It doesn't matter if we redefine marriage as humans to include same-sex relationships. We are merely taking biblical ideas, biblical terms, and then 
subverting them and corrupting them and twisting them. And I would say that the movement that is set out to redefine marriage to broaden the circle to include homosexual couples is subverting a biblical godly term in the same way that we see that the state and authorities of this world corrupt ideas such as authority or government and justice and pervert them with their ideals and their visions of right and wrong. The world's objection to this is that we are telling people to deny their identity, that they are born gay, and that who are we to tell them that they have to give up this intrinsic part of their identity and life that would deny them happiness. But <laughs> when it's one of those things where someone thinks they have a gotcha or they think they are, they're going to catch you in something where you have to defend something. And really, it's like, well, no. Yes, I am telling them they have to give up their identity because a Christian doesn't base their identity in their sin or in their sinful desires or in their in in the desires of the flesh or in how they see themselves but rather we paint our identity by who God says that we are and we paint our identity as being a child of God as being born again a new creation in Jesus Christ amen to that i, I want people to die to their sinful identities that's the core of the gospel and the good news is is that there are so many people who used to be self-identifying LGBT individuals who have come to Christ and who did go through the experience of being born again and who put, laid everything down at the foot of the cross, including their homosexual or even transgender or any other sort of sinful desires that they had. One person who I've watched in a couple interviews and read some of her testimony, Rachel Gibson, who I'll, I'll link some of her stuff in the show notes, has spoken about her experience and how she was a young person and sleeping around with people of the same sex and drinking and partying. and But then through her journey, she started reading the Bible and being drawn to the figure of Jesus. And then it hit a point one day where she just realized that all of these things that she had identified as, they meant nothing compared to the promises of God. And she still experiences, in a lot of ways, the same sort of same-sex attraction that she used to experience. And if you talk to a lot of saved, reformed, ex-LGBT Christians, they'll tell you that God doesn't always just deliver them from their sinful desires completely. And just now some people have that, but other people, they don't just wake up the next day with their sexuality completely restored to that from before the fall. But rather, they know that true happiness, that true meaning and fulfillment and everlasting life doesn't come through chasing their sinful desires. Even if those sinful desires are something they've been born with and had their entire life, but rather they know that they will find ultimate happiness and ultimate fulfillment through following Christ, and that there is no greater joy or love they will ever receive than in being in relationship with their perfect Savior. And this is what the core of the Bible teaches about any sin, not just homosexuality, that we can be born again and we can be rescued from our sinful desire so that we no longer have to be slaves to our sin, but that God can give us a heart of flesh to replace our heart of stone. And all of us must pick up our cross and follow after him. And that means sometimes that we have to give up something, whether it was a dream, whether it was a relationship, or whether it's a struggle we have with sin. But God encourages us that he's overcome this world and that he can sustain us and that he is better than anything that this world has to offer. So homosexuality is definitely not part of God's design. It is sinful, and we are called to something greater. And so because of the definition of marriage and because of the sin that homosexuality is, gay marriage is something that Christians rightfully are not advocates for, and rather something that it's something that the church 
most of the church at least advocates against, and those who have corrupted the teachings of scriptures will have to answer for that one day. But what does this mean about what we should do legally? Because, as I said before, libertarians and anarchists, well, the question isn't so much what is sinful then. The question that the anarchist wants to, and the libertarian wants to wrestle with is, when is violence justified? And that is a question that the Christian needs to answer, too. When is violence justified? When are we called to wield the sword to go after others and to thwart them in whatever they are doing? And I would say that a good text for talking about this is actually Romans 13. Romans 13 says that the higher powers, or what's often referred to as the governing authorities, are a minister of God to our good, and that those who do good have nothing to fear from those who are in authority or in higher power, but those who do evil should beware because they do not wield the sword in vain. If we are going to use this passage and to say that, well, if it's wielding the sword, if the authorities wield the sword against evil, and we define evil in this context to be anything that is sinful— we are then advocating for a government that would not only ban gay marriage, but that would ban lying, that would ban worshiping any god other than the Christian god. It would ban those who would eat to excess and who would be gluttonous and overweight. If you really bring that sort of premise to its logical conclusion, you're advocating for a dystopian giant nanny big brother state that is involved in all areas of our lives. And the other thing that I can assure you is that once you create a state with that much power, the Christians are not going to, for very long, be the ones in charge of that institution. And I think looking at our government today and seeing how as the government power to intrude on people's lives has grown, the use of that power has drifted ever further away from enforcing Christian norms. Rather, it's been enforcing secular and anti-Christian norms ever increasingly. And this is because this is not what Romans 13 is talking about. The point of Romans 13 is actually very much reminiscent of the point that Jesus makes when he tells the Pharisees to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Paul's point here is that Godly authority is a terror to those who do evil and not to those who do good, but that the Roman government is the exact opposite of this. And in fact, most earthly governments that we see fail to live up to this measure. Now, this does not mean that God is against government. God is in favor of government and in favor of civil justice. But like we talked about, several times in this show, and you go back and watch episode one where I go into this in more in greater detail, and also in the last episode with Carrie Baldwin, but Christian norms of civil justice and government require that the authority of those who wield govern, governing power must be necessarily limited because of God's sovereignty and because of what the Bible defines justice as. And Christian ideas of justice and defense are not about vengeance or about imposing morality through violence. And this is not only contrary to what the scriptures teach, but it's contrary to the example that Christ gave us. Those who are lost in a sea of sin, those who are enslaved to their flesh. They are not in need of men bearing swords or guns threatening them to get their lives in order and to stop sinning. This is contrary to the gospel, which says that we cannot save ourselves and that we cannot free ourselves from the bondage of sin on our own. We need a savior to do this. And the role of the church is not to wield the sword or violence against those who are sinning and in need of a Savior, but to bring the gospel to them, and to bring the gospel to them in the way that Christ did, in the way that the apostles did. Now, I know that there's a struggle here. 
there's a struggle here because on one hand, if we say that we are against gay marriage, there are many in society who will then automatically assume, well, if something is bad, you should want the government to ban it. And then on the other hand, if we try to say, well, no, we don't want to ban gay marriage, the opposite reaction then comes and people think that, well, if you don't want to ban it, you must think it's good. And so you will, the Christian libertarian and anarchist will often find themselves caught between those two extremes and find that they don't satisfy the radical adherence of either. But we don't seek to please men or to seek the praise of men. We seek to obey God and to please God. And the division here that we have to focus on is between what is rhetorically correct in terms of what is biblically based morality and what is a biblical definition of sin, and then between praxis and how we engage the world, how we act in the world and engage with sinners. And while we need to stand firm on the biblical foundations of right and wrong and to not be to not fall into the temptation of the world to call what is wrong right just to gain their acceptance or to be more liked. No, we have to stand on what the Bible says, and that means that we have to reject homosexuality as something that is something someone can be engaged in and also be in be pleasing to God, be doing something that is within God's natural order, it's sinful. It cannot be within God's natural order. But we then also need to stand firm on what is Christian praxis, what is the Christian means of engaging with sin. And again, we don't struggle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the forces of darkness. And we are to be fishers of men. We are to be seeking to rescue men and women with the gospel. And when you hear the testimonies of Christians who were once part of the LGBT community, who were engaged in a sinful homosexual lifestyle, what saved them wasn't a law. What saved them was the cross. And that is what Christians should do. And that is why the Christian stance on gay marriage should be to reject homosexuality, but to love homosexuals. And not to love them by affirming what they do, but loving them similarly to the way that Jesus loved sinners, where he would rescue them from the mob and he would defend them, but he would also tell them to go and sin no more. I hope that this episode has been helpful to you into unpacking this position. This sort of thought process is very similar for other issues, whether it be abortion, which I talked about in the last episode with Carrie Baldwin, whether it be gay marriage. It's similar to the positions on drug prohibition that I had with Greg from the Libertarian Party Sober Caucus a few episodes ago. And this is the narrow road that Christians must walk. So I hope that this episode brought some value to you and gave you something to think about. If you like this kind of content, please share it around. If you agree and you like it, you know, we always like to hear reviews and comments and feedback. If you disagree, you can find me on Twitter at Biblical Anarchy and let me know what you think I got wrong. And I like to be challenged on my views, but I also like to engage with people and try to make a further elaboration and a more ongoing case for why I think that this is the correct position. And I think when we have the, start talking, taking these things issue by issue, it builds the case for biblical anarchy brick by brick rather than all at once. And that is why I think that anarchism is the natural conclusion of applying biblical principles towards governance and justice. So thanks again for listening. We will be back next week with another episode. And until then, make sure that you are 
rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but more importantly, rendering unto God what is God's. The Biblical Anarchy Podcast is a part of the Christians for Liberty Network, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. If you love this podcast, it helps us reach more with a message of freedom when you rate and review us on your favorite podcast apps and share with others. If you want to support the production of the Biblical Anarchy Podcast, please consider donating to the Libertarian Christian Institute at biblicalanarchypodcast.com, where you can also sign up to receive special announcements and resources related to biblical anarchy. Thanks for tuning in.